Hi folks, this is the first video on digital cinema. We'll be talking about Lev Manovich and his ideas about moving away from the index and toward a composite. And we'll start to talk about how Speed Racer is a film that seems to respond to this evolution in cinema. So the question is, what do we make of an image like this? Um, there's a strangeness inherent to this image and especially this scene from Speed Racer. Um, a strange scene in an already strange film. What do we make of its visual design? We're largely going to talk about the visual design of this film, not so much the narrative and thematics of it. Um, so let's think about this film, uh, this kind of sequence we'll get to in a little bit, and the questions of what is digital cinema. Okay, so immediately it might give away Manovich's ambitions by looking at his title. The title of this short essay is What is Digital Cinema? You should immediately think of our friend Andre Bazin, whose collection of essays is titled What is Cinema? When you say what is X and you're doing um, analysis of film or media, you're doing something very close to the goals of classical film theory, right? What is X is a question of philosophy. It's a question of quote unquote ontology. What is the nature or essence of thing X? That was a big question of classical film theory that kind of fell to the wayside in um, contemporary film theory but it was with the transition to digital images uh, that we brought back those philosophical questions. And that is the flavor of theory that Lev Manovich is conducting. So let's look at, I think, one of the most useful quotations um, from Manovich, where you can really get the main kernel of his argument. So he says, as cinema enters the digital age, manual techniques are again becoming the commonplace in the filmmaking process. Consequently, Cinema can no longer be clearly distinguished from animation. It is no longer an indexical media technology, but rather a subgenre of painting. Digital cinema is a particular case of animation which uses live action footage as one of its many elements. If you're going to like pick apart the logic of this claim, you might fixate on a couple terms. Um, the big one is this one, indexical. What is the index? What is indexical? But we want to think about the difference between this idea of index and the idea of the manual. And the logic of this claim, those things are opposed. Why are they opposed? So you'll recall that uh, the term index is a, a concept borrowed from this American pragmatist philosopher, C.S. Peirce. We understand the uh, significance of index by comparing it to the other two kinds of signs that Peirce cataloged, that is icon and symbol. Very simply put, an index is a kind of sign that shows the evidence for the existence of what it refers to. Um, so a footprint um, is probably the best example of an index. You look at a footprint in the ground and it testifies to the existence of a foot being there at some time in the past. It does more than say a painting of a foot. Um, it testifies to the existence of a particular foot. Why is this important? Well, because imagine we have an apple and I have a, and then I've taken a photograph of the apple and I've given you the photograph. And then say I produced a second image by sitting there and painting the apple. And then say I produce a third image by uh, getting on Adobe Illustrator um, or some kind of uh, rendering uh, image making software and, and rendering the apple. That's three images. Uh, the point that um, our friend Manovich is trying to make is where should we put the Adobe Illustrator image of the apple? Should we put it close to the photograph or should we put it closer to the painting? His claim um, is that it's closer to the painting and that this tells us something about computer generated or digital images more generally. While this uh, CG rendering of an apple actually looks probably more like the painting than it does like um, the actual apple or even the photograph of the apple, we will soon, or we, we now uh, have apples that look like this. Um, and this is actually not a photograph of an apple. It is indeed a CG rendering of an apple that looks quite photorealistic. Um, Manovich's claim would remain. In terms of its essence or its ontology, this CG rendering of an apple is closer in its essence to a painting of an apple than it is to the photograph, despite looking a lot like a photograph of an apple. So he's trying to make a claim about what, in essence, digital technology or digital images are. Um, he thinks that they are closer to uh, the manual techniques of painting. So let's consider this argument, right? It's no longer an indexical media technology, but rather a subgenre of painting. On a superficial level, um, indeed some uh, digital cinema works, um, films that seem as if we would be right to call them digital cinema, in some ways evoke um, the freedom of painting, um, the idea of, of the image not being tied to 
material material reality. That's not in indexing anything. And this is true when you have, say, digital actors and motion capture, right? Um, we know when we look at Gollum that he wasn't indexed, right? That he was created. That maybe his facial expressions are are, in, are indexes of the facial expressions of the actor. But in some level, like the whole being of Gollum, we don't believe that there was this, you know, small creature that they got onto set and then they photographed, right? We know that's not true. We don't have an indexical faith. Same thing goes for digital creatures like the um, Transformers or any kind of digital monster. And you might even say a movie like uh, Great Gatsby or any film that has digital environments that seem too fantastic or that, that seems so fantastic that we recognize the impossibility of that actually being a real indexed space. Um, we might say, ah, there's something about this that is like animation because I can see the fact that it doesn't index the real reality, right? I'm in an illusion. Manovich will, uh, will talk a little bit about um, what it means that films that films start to look like this, right? Um, it means something important for him that we are moving to films um, with this new technology that feel as if they are, in some sense, free from the strictures of material reality. So he'll say, while retaining visual realism unique to the photographic process, film obtains the plasticity, which was previously only possible in painting or animation. Notice that there's a kind of value judgment in there. That plasticity seems like a good thing. And it's something that we lost, right? It used to be in uh, in, in animation, right, which is this kind of marginalized subset of cinema. So Manovich wants to kind of put animation on the map as maybe the thing that becomes the central um, touchstone for thinking about digital cinema. Um, he says, manual construction and animation of images gave birth to cinema um, and slipped into the margins, only to reappear as the foundation of digital cinema. If we give a long history of cinema, that is, say, the moving image, we realize that moving images, if we count like um, pre- cinematic um, toys, right? Like the Fina Kistoscope, like those things that you create the illusion of movement with. Those things are not photographic. Um, they are pre-cinematic because they create moving images, but they don't, they don't often use photographic images. They just use any kind of drawing to create um, the illusion of, of movement, right? Think of it like um, different forms of creating a flip book that you might, that you might do it at home. Um, those things are cinematic in some way, right? But they are not photographic. Uh, so he continues, the history of the moving image thus makes a full circle. Born from animation, cinema pushed animation to its boundary, only to become one particular case of animation in the end. Yeah, so once again, he's pointing out that in intro film class, we don't get animation because it's not what we think of as cinema proper. Photography or photographic cinema is the kind of equivalent of cinema. Um, he says, no longer strictly locked in the photographic, it opens itself toward the painterly. So what I want to do just is draw your attention to the value judgment that Manovich is making here, that he seems to think that digital cinema is maybe a good thing, um, and it's transforming the medium to some, uh, or it's unlocking some lost potential that we had in the beginning of cinema, right? And it makes sense on a certain level, because while the, the photographic is magical, it can like transport you to realities that were there. In some ways it is limited, right? You can only do so much in the real world um, uh, you can only do what is uh, possible by the bounds of physics. You can maybe use montage to um, give the impression that we're, um, we're breaking the laws of physics, but at the end of the day, you can't quite do as much as you can do in animation, where the uh, possibilities of representation are as boundless as the imagination of what you can simply draw. Now, I'm saying this only to point out a, a slight kind of contradiction or attention in, in his account, right? The digital aspect of images opens uh, film up to new possibilities that are resonant of the freedom of animation. However, a lot of the work that goes into digital production practices is not animated like, it's more, it's a new kind of realism. We have the capacity to be like animation or like painting, and yet we do stuff like this. I'm gonna show you a good example of this. It's a SFX, um, or sorry, a, a visual FX, a VFX reel from uh, David Fincher's Gone Girl. David Fincher loves to use VFX, uh, often in ways that are invisible. Um, and, I, and I love the uh, almost absurdity of the, of the degree to which this film is uh, just made up of so many special effects. Even when you're looking at a film that doesn't seem to be effects heavy, that is, it doesn't seem to have images that contain the freedom and malleability of digital images, often the case they do. I could also further this, this claim that I'm trying to make, or this micro claim that I'm trying to make, um, by looking at 
how much realism or photorealism is in is in cartoons. So think of Pixar cartoons or Disney CGI cartoons. Yes, they have cartoony characters and there's a lot of kind of physical impossibilities and fantastic representations happening in them. And yet there is a desire across them to create images, usually of environments um, or of uh, natural objects like snow or like uh, trees or like grass or dirt. Um, there is this tendency to make them photorealistic, right? There is this desire to recreate the stuff that was easily and automatically recreated with photographic images, right? Is this a freedom for the, from the photographic? Technically, yes, but we still seem to be aesthetically enslaved in some sense um, to the desire to recreate uh, our world and not manufacture new ones. So I just want to draw out this tension a little bit because I find it an interesting one. Um, a great example of that is the remake of, of Lion King. Um, so I want to just draw the tension here and the tension between the freedom that Manovich uh, gives to the digital uh, in, in its essence and the fact that a lot of things produced uh, with that technology do not demonstrate a freedom, but rather um, an adherence to, to material reality. Um, and then we have something like this, which certainly does not look like any of the above. It doesn't look like this, and it doesn't look like this, and it doesn't look like this either. Um, it has its own aesthetic that certainly we would have to agree doesn't feel photographic, especially in a sequence like this one. Um, so what do we make of that? Well, the first thing that I want to make of it is to say um, it's an exception that proves maybe the rule, but also I want to talk about something that Manovich talks about in the other essay, which is an aesthetics of the composite. First of all, what is the composite and compositing and uh, what is Manovich's interest in it? So this is what Manovich will say. Digital compositing exemplifies a more general operation of computer culture assembling together a number of elements to create a single seamless object. Thus, we can distinguish between compositing in a wider sense, um, that is the general operation, and compositing in a narrow sense, that is assembling moving image elements to create a photorealistic shot. So he's bringing uh, to mind the notion that compositing is a, is a word that we use to simply mean bringing together things. Um, but he's trying to say that there's this special revolution in moving image making in which it becomes more and more frequent to think of compositing as the organizing principle of making moving images. And I wanna say that there's something about the film that we watched, Speed Racer, that gets at something essential about this compositing. And it doesn't seem very far-fetched to say. So what is compositing in terms of the world of digital image making? Well, it's not just Photoshop, but any kind of image making software uses the logic of layers that you can see uh, and then compresses them uh, to a point where you don't see the seams between them. The same thing can go for Adobe Premiere or any kind of digital editing suite. You can see vertically the, the layers that you are using, right? We make sense of the, of the singular thing that we're making by thinking of it as the result of vertically stacked pieces that when put together are no longer visible. Um, so I wanna just draw your attention to a few major claims that Manovich will make about this compositing stuff. The first he'll say, when it comes to digital moving images, that composites are generally invisible, right? Um, I've shown you this VFX reel so that you can see the discrete elements of this particular shot. Um, but I would imagine when you're watching the film, you don't see them, right? Or you don't pay attention to them. The seams are very, very slight, right? That's what it means to say that composites are generally invisible. Um, and he'll say, to expand upon this, just to show some evidence for my, for my summary, digital compositing in which different spaces are combined to, into a single seamless virtual space is a good example of the alternative aesthetics of continuity. However, compositing in general can be understood as a counterpart of montage aesthetics. Montage aims to create visual, stylistic, semantic, and emotional dissonance dissonance between different elements. In contrast, compositing aims to blend them into a seamless whole, a single gestalt. So I'll get um, to this notion of um, montage in a moment, but right now I just want you to pay attention to the part where he says that they're blended into a seamless whole, a single gestalt, that, right? that word that means a whole, uh, a thing whose parts are not necessarily discerned. Uh, so you can see that here when you just isolate the final image. Um, interestingly enough, 
If you wanted to do, say, a medium history of compositing, yeah, Manovich does this, but doesn't quite go as far as I might want him to. Um, I would go to, say, uh, matte painting, right? And matte painting is a great example of a pre-digital composite. Why? Because the camera is still seeing all of these things, right? It's not post-production. Digital would be if the things were ind more independent. But still, what you get here is a nice example. Um, of just how seamless the final version is. I mean, this usually astounds people because um, when you look at this shot, um, you can barely get a sense, unless you kind of know how things work, um, that there is a totally different ontological um, existence between what is here in the shot and what is here. Um, that what is on the left is in fact a flat picture, and what is on the right is in fact real, uh, inhabitable, voluminous space. The same thing happens here. Uh, and safety lasts even earlier, right, 1923. Um, the same idea of taking two things, and, and this isn't exactly matte painting, but it is using camera trickery to say, um, create the illusion that two things are in a, a spatial relation that they do not in fact occupy. So uh, Manovich will say, most often the compositive sequence simulates a traditional film shot. That is, it looks like something that took place in real physical space was filmed by a real film camera, right? Um, that there's a realism attached to compositing, that there is a single gestalt, that there are no seams. Number two, if composites tend to be invisible, they also tend to be continuous. What does it mean by continuous? Well, why am I showing you an image from gravity? Well, because the opening of gravity is famous for giving us a, say, 14, 15 minute single continuous shot. Now, why would a film um, do this? Well, there's something kind of magical about the ability to use digital compositing to create the impression of spatial continuity, a spatial and temporal continuity, right? It almost shows off the possibilities of di digital manufacture because it is giving us this impression that we're really in this continuous space, right? When you break things up with montage, you are uh, almost lessening the, uh, the illusion that we've created real space. But here there's this ambition for creating temporal and spatial continuity with digital compositing. And Manovich thinks that this is not just gravity, that this is actually um, a general trend. He'll say, the logic um, of the postmodern aesthetics of the 1980s and the logic of the computer-based comp compositing of the 90s are not the same. So I actually think that compositing as an aesthetic changes from the 80s to the 90s. And I, I would say that it also continues beyond the 90s into the 2000s um, with movies like Gravity and really anything Quaron does. He loves these like long digital takes. Um, in the postmodern aesthetics of the 80s, historical references and media quotes are maintained as distinct elements. Boundaries between elements are well-defined, right? Seams are visible, in other words. These tools enabled hard-edged copy and paste operations, but not smooth multi-layer composites. Compositing the 90s supports a different aesthetic characterized by smoothness and continuity, right? So, so here we have smoothness and continuity. Um, and I might say, just going back a bit, here we have copy and paste, right? Um, and I think I just want to draw your attention to the contrast uh, for a moment. Um, what's number three? If old media relies on montage, new media creates um, an aesthetics of composited continuity, right? So he'll actually kind of thicken the stakes of making these claims about um, compositing by comparing it to montage. That's actually really useful and a smart thing to do. Why? Be because what is montage? It's a general uh, aesthetic strategy of juxtaposing disparate elements. Compositing is also about juxtaposing disparate elements, but compositing does not highlight their juxtaposition. It hides it. Yes, there are disparate elements in this image, but I can't see them. The disparate elements here are very much seen. Um, and yet they still combine to create something new, right? So the combination is an, is an effect of both, um, but the visibility of the thing is only an effect of montage. Um, and, and Eisenstein will, get, will uh, highlight this, right? He really likes the idea that you can really see the seams, um, that you can feel their impacts, right? That's kind of what Eisensteinian uh, montage is all about. So um, I'll continue what he says here, um, that is Manovich. Editing or montage is the key 20th century technology for creating fake realities. So it's not just about creating meaning, it's also about creating fake reality. He's drawing attention to the way in which we think about the digital as um, 
as, as the fake, right, creating fake worlds, like in Gravity, they weren't actually in space, it's fake in some degree, um, so is the David Fincher film, but he'll say that, um, that the, the fake thing was also a huge, a huge part of montage. As theorized by Vertov, film can overcome its indexical nature through montage by presenting a viewer with objects that never existed in reality. So to remind you of what that is, I'll show you um, a little sequence from Anshan Andalou, the surrealist film from Dali and Bunuel, which gives us a nice example of the idea of uh, creative geography. That was, the t that was a term that our good friend Kuleshov uh, used to describe the way in which you can use montage to create the impression of contiguous space that is not in fact contiguous. In fact, there are three different realities. There's an interior, there's an exterior with a door, and then there's the beach all of which are given the impression of being contiguous, but they are not. It's fake. This is fake too, but in different ways, right? That's the important thing. Uh, and then that's why this is a kind of interesting kind of observation to make. Now, I'm saying this so that we understand um, the, uh, the crux of Manovich's claim about compositing, but also to highlight some of the differences that we'll get in a movie like Speed Racer. So I might say that it's an ode to the visual logic of composites, that we can see. It is not following the trend of giving us composites whose seams are invisible. And there's something about that that's on display in this sequence. And in the next video, we're gonna be looking at this sequence as well as the aesthetic patterns across the film as a whole to talk about how a logic of composites, an aesthetic logic of composites reveals itself in the film.